hopefully it'll start picking up here. All right, well, good morning uh, to everybody. Um, and again, I'd like to extend a happy Father's Day to our, uh, our fathers uh, that are in uh, our lives. Um, this means uh, both there are fathers that are fathers by blood, and there, there are fathers that are out there who have taken up the mantle to be what another father has decided not to be. And so we are thankful for all the men who take up those roles. Uh, society, we live in a society that tries to mar marginalize fathers, right? We live We live in a society that marginalizes fathers. It's by no mistake that we see that when you look at TV shows and stuff like that, you will find no strong father characters on TV. Most of them either are, if I could say this way, buffoons, or they are the weak person in the relationship. Because that's how the devil wants things to be done. And he tried that at the very beginning, at the Garden of Eden. And I'm not here to preach a sermon on that, maybe for next year, but I said those to thank, say that, that it is a wonderful blessing. Not only will mother step up, but when a father stands his post for his wife and his children. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, speaking of fathers, we're going to talk more about our wonderful father today. As we get into part two of the Lord's Supper, which is a great, wonderful sacrament that God has given us through Jesus Christ that reminds us not only what God has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. And so we're going to get to part two of that block of text in Luke chapter 22, uh, verses uh, uh, will be verses 14 through 23. Uh, so I ask you, if you can stand, please stand as we read the word of God. Luke chapter 22. Let's start all the way to 14. Verse 14. And when the hour came, he reclined at table with the apostles, with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. For behold, the hand of him who betrays me is on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question what, amongst one another, which of them could it could be who was going to do this? Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are gracious, that you are abounding to us in goodness and mercy, and that your love is steadfast in our lives, and that you've given us your Son is the evidence and the affirmation and the proof of your love. And so we just pray, Father Lord, that you would help us to understand today the deeper riches of communion that we celebrate here once a month in the church. That as we take the bread and the wine, that it's divine internal truths that it speaks in our lives not only today, but the future to come. And so we just pray, Father, that this word would fill us with thanksgiving gratitude for all that you've done. We pray this pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, there we go. Amen. 
All we would have been missing now is that just, you know, you remember back, some of y'all were too young to remember this, but I do. Remember when we had like six channels on TV? That was it. And then when it would cut out, it would just be this little time thing going around. We'll be back right in a minute. We needed one of those uh, this morning. Amen. Short commercial break. Amen. So, as I was saying, we, we get to an exciting part. We did part one last week where, you know, Jesus began, they began to sit to celebrate the Passover. And one of the things, we've talked a lot about the Passover now in the last couple of weeks, but we've talked about it a lot ever since Jesus came into Jerusalem on a donkey's colt because he is our Passover lamb. We talked a lot about this. One thing that you should observe when we talked about the Passover and how that you separate, uh, celebrate it, uh, that we should come to, uh, come to mind that a life of gratitude is fueled by what? Joyful remembrance. Joyful remembrance of God's goodness upon our lives. As a matter of fact, a lot of times we have a lot of things going on in our life that would cause us to complain and to despair and to be down. And one of the primary things that lifts us up out of the miry pit of despair and all the dysfunction and things we're dealing with is to start giving glory to God. Start remembering, start thanking God for all he has done. And you will be amazed at how your whole disposition begins to change in the midst of those things. And so a life of gratitude is fueled by joyful remembrance of God's goodness upon our lives. And this is the primary reason God commanded the Jews to commemorate the Passover, by which his love and saving grace was experienced in all its power in God's deliverance of the Jews from Egypt. And so living a life of daily thanksgiving, what does it do? It strengthens, I mentioned before, it strengthens us in faith in God in our present. But what about the future, right? Doesn't the Passover and the Lord's Supper offer something for our future, right? Because remember, the Passover was an earthly shadow, right? An earthly shadow of eternal glory to come. And so now what Jesus does now, he incorporates the Lord's Supper, which is a meal of thanksgiving to the Lord, that we as Christians, what do we do? We partake of the life of God. We partake of the life of God that reminds us of what Christ has done for his people now and what he will do when he returns. And so this Sunday, we will explore the significance that is symbolized now in the bread and the wine. And I pray that you really listen because this is what we are doing. This is what we're remembering. This is what we're taking joy in every first Sunday when we take of the bread and the wine elements. And so before we get into the text, I want to do something we did last week. I want to first just kind of refresh it because everybody wasn't here. I want to refresh our memory of how the Jews actually celebrate the Passover. I think that's important. Because you will see some similarities between how Jesus does the Lord's Supper, but the power that the Lord's Supper has that's even greater than the Passover that which the Jews celebrated. So as I mentioned last Sunday, if you went into a typical Jewish household, they celebrated in this way. So normally, first, there will be kind of an opening prayer by the head of the household, right? This will be a prayer of thanksgiving unto God. And then what will happen is they would eat bitter herbs. What were the bitter herbs about? That was simply about the fact that it was a reminder of their harsh and bitter slavery in Egypt. And then some biblical scholars believe that while that was still mulling around in their mouth and whatnot, that there would be this, as I mentioned last Sunday, this kind of catechism type of Q&A session, right, that we use in Christianity to teach the next generation their faith. Right? You don't learn your faith by osmosis, by the way. It must be taught. It must be remembered. All these various things. But there will be this little small little Q&A session at this moment while these bitter herbs may still be in their mouth where one of the children, usually one of the sons, would ask of the father, why do we celebrate this Passover? And then the father who has prayed for them, he would teach. There will be a sermon up in here where he would teach them why. Why? Because God commanded them that they not only celebrate the Passover, but they teach them to every generation, to generation, to generation, that they may not forget their God. And that's important, right? Because what we don't realize, a lot of times, especially in Jewish history, if you study uh, the Old Testament, one of the primary issues that happened, for example, in the book of Judges is what? They forgot their God from as each generation went out. So it's important that it be taught. So this is what happened at this moment. Then when this Q&A session is done, there will be singing of hymns. 
primarily through Psalm 113 and 114, which focuses on the steadfast love and goodness of God. They would sing through those things. And then, last but not least, they would finally eat of the lamb, right? There was a lamb that was sacrificed. They would eat of the lamb, and they would do so as prescribed in Exodus 12, where God commanded them, this is how you should eat it. And then they would close, I guess, sort of like a benediction. There would be prayer and singing, and they would wrap up. Now, remember, Jesus was born in the earth under the law, which means he would have celebrated this with his family in a very similar way. So he clearly knows what he is doing. And so now in our Luke record, in our focus text, he institutes and adds to this divine order the handing down of the Lord's Supper. So in verse 17, he says, And he took a cup, and, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. Now, what are some of the things you notice right out the gate that what Jesus does? The first thing he does is he gives thanks. That's the first thing he does. You know, something you and I should do before we ever eat any food that goes in my, even the Trinity. But bow to his, Lord, thank you for this. So he gives thanks. Well, the second thing that you notice that he does is that he takes one cup of wine that he has and he commands it be divided among them. So if you picture the room, the upper room, they don't all have like their own full glass of wine. They don't have anything. Jesus has the wine, right, symbolizing his blood. And what does he do? He hands it to them. He tells them, divide it among yourselves, all of them. Well, what does this act convey that Jesus does this? And what it does is that it emphasizes his unity between him and them. And every time you and I observe communion and we drink of the wine it is representative of the union we have with Christ and the father through his blood right and it's a the lifting of the wine glass is something we should know even in our secular culture right what do people do when they gather around right you know and they lift the wine glass up you know, they have that one bottle of champagne, and they spread it all around. Everybody shares this bottle, and they lift this wine glass up, right? And what are they doing? They do it at one time as an act of tribute and praise to what unifies and brings them together, right? One person speaks, and there is a toast. We understand that in our culture, how much greater must we see what Jesus is doing, who is God? And so when I read this passage, I think about David's words. Right, David says in Psalm 133, verse 1, he says, Behold, how good and pleasant is it when the brothers dwell in unity. Dwell in unity. And so Jesus continues with the meal. So as the cup is being passed around and distributed to his disciples, he repeats the, he repeats the promise of eternal reunification. Right. He says in verse 18, for I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Right. Now, remember where we are in the text that Jesus is soon to depart from this life. He is soon to be arrested and killed. Right. And remember, he prophesied about this on several quake occasions through the gospel. Right. And he knows when he departs that he will deeply grieve them and add sorrow upon sorrow. Right. Remember when he told them when they was like, well, Lord, we don't know where you're going. We don't know the way. And he says, I am the way. I am the way. The truth and the life. But he knows that his departure, his physical departure from them will add sorrow upon sorrow. So what does he do? Because he is a good, good father. He is a good, good Lord. What does he do? He reassures them of their reunion. In other words, if he was with us today, he would plainly say it in these ways. If you look at everything in the, Old, in the New Testament, he would say it in these ways. He says, though my earthly communion and fellowship with you is coming to an end, I will return. I will return. And our fellowship will be renewed in the new kingdom to come that is everything that this world is not. Is not. There you will see me face to face in the new creation that is filled with my light, my love for you, and eternal victory. There in my presence you shall be with me forever where I will wipe away all tears, death, and sorrow. And that, my friends, is a, a hallelujah moment for us every day. Because ultimately, like baptism, we don't just observe communion one day a month. But we should live that communion out 
every day, every day. Now, you notice what Jesus says. He says in the new kingdom, right? He says, for I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the vine until the new kingdom of God comes, right? In the new kingdom, how does the meaning of the past fold, how is it fulfilled, right? Now, remember we talked about last week, we talked about how the uh, Passover is glorified in the new kingdom. But how is it now fulfilled? How is it completed unto Jesus? And there are two things that I want to spotlight that reflects this fulfillment of the Passover. Number one, in the new kingdom, the wicked will cease, will be unable to trouble God's people ever again, ever again. You know, remember John sees in his revelation, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 27, he sees the new Jerusalem coming up out of heaven. And he records in his uh, writings, he says in Revelation chapter 21, verse 27, he says, But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. That nothing evil will ever be there. And those who are written in the Lamb's book of life, in other words, those who have believed in Jesus and faith for salvation, we will be with him. And not in these earthly temples, praise God. No, no, these things stay down here. They stay down here. You know, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, we get a glorified body, right, that does not know evil, that doesn't, as a Christian, as a Christian, you live a life where you strive against the sin that's within you and you want to depart from it. Or as Paul talked about, who would deliver me from this body of death? That in this life, aside from sin, that our flesh is inflicted by the fall of creation. That every day, especially when you start getting north of 40 years old, you feel the decay in your body, the fall. And even if you're not that old, if you live in central Texas, you breathe in the pollen every week, like I did yesterday. Okay, I got lozenges in my pocket just so I can preach today. But all that will be put away. Even our grieving over those who have passed, who have been in the Lord, that Jesus will put all those things away. So in the new kingdom, wickedness will cease, and we can never be troubled by them ever again. The second thing that I want us to think about when we think about the meaning of the Passover, how it is fulfilled in the new kingdom, is that, that in the new kingdom we shall enter the eternal rest of God. The eternal rest of God. And remember, we're often reminded of this promise because the Father made a promise in the Scriptures. We often remind this promise when we, quote the mo- when we quote the most recited scripture at funerals and memorial service. What scripture is that? Psalm 23. David, right? When David says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For here it is, for you are with me. For you are with me, and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Right? That we are reminded of these words that strengthen our faith in the presence, in the present. But Psalm 23 doesn't end there. There's only six verses in there. But in the sixth verse, David says these words that is the promise of eternal security and future rest with God in the new creation. David says in verse 6, he says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. And so remember that when we think about how the Passover will be fulfilled in the new kingdom, that all evil, all that is corrupted will bother you and I no more. No more. And then why is that? It's because we will enter into the eternal rest of God. And so now back to the text. We talked a little bit about the wine. Let's talk about the bread, right? We know that the requirement for Jesus to die, he is our Passover lamb that is getting ready to come to a climax. It won't be long now before Judas comes in with this gaggle of soldiers to take him to a kangaroo court that he may be tried and sentenced and killed, right? 
But at this moment of redemption history, what he's doing before that happens, he is helping his disciples and us, because to be a Christian is to be a disciple. They are not separate, okay? He's helping the disciples and us to understand the ways that the Jews have traditionally celebrated the Passover, right? The way that they celebrate the Passover is getting ready to come to a very violent end, a very violent and gruesome end that he will do when he sheds his blood on Calvary as our Passover lamb. And so at this meal, he helps us understand that how the Passover and the Lord's Supper is linked, right? How it is linked as they both point to him. They both point to him. Because remember, my friends, no matter what we read in the Bible, no matter how much we, we really appreciate the saints in the Bible, no matter how much times we read Hebrews 11 of those who walk the life of faith, even though they were not perfect people like us, they walk the life of faith. They're not the heroes of creation. They're not the heroes of creation. Christ is the hero of creation, right? Think about it. Okay, one of the excellent examples of that is what uh, some of the, you know, the, Jesus always had a couple of disciples that, that it seems to me that they were kind of the leaders of the twelve. And who was that? Peter, James, and John. How often have you read the Gospels? Usually when he goes off to special missions, he takes them three with him. But there was a time in Matthew 17 where the Bible says he takes them up a mountain and he was transfigured before them. Transfigured. In other words, it's like the Father pulls back the veil of this earth, and they begin to see Jesus as he is in all his radiant glory, all his radiant glory. And the Bible says that Peter and them are confused. They don't know what's going on, you know, and Peter, you know, speaks from his mouth. He said, Lord, because what do they see? Not only see Jesus, but they see Moses and Elijah with Jesus, right? Now, the only way they know this Moses and Elijah is by supernatural, because there's no way possible they could know what Moses and Elijah looked like. But they knew what they looked like because they're in the presence of God, in the presence of God. And it's important to understand what you see about Jesus there when you see Moses and Elijah there, because what does Moses represent? The law. What does Elijah represent? The prophets. And all the law and the prophets are fulfilled in who? Jesus. But see, Peter and him, they get the memo, right? And not really knowing what's going on, he speaks, he says, Lord, let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, as if they're on equal plane at all. And so what happens? The Bible says that the cloud of glory came down upon them. Remember we talked about before what the cloud means in the Bible? When you see it, it means the presence of God, the presence of God. And this cloud comes down, and they hear the voice of the Father. That says, he says, this is my beloved Son. Listen to him. Listen to him. Why? Because Jesus is the hero of all creation. He is the center of the Bible and redemptive history. He, he would come as the final sacrifice that is not prepared with human hands, but prepared by our Father, where he puts his own son on the cross. He is the only and all-sufficient sacrifice of sins for his people. There's no other place in which sins can be forgiven. There's no other name of the heaven which men can be saved. Men can be saved. And so therefore, that's when God, therefore, when God gave Moses the Passover for Israel in Exodus chapter 12, guess what that did? It pointed forward to Jesus. Forward to Jesus. And then when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, which is to be observed and remembrance for all his church, what does the Lord's Supper do when we commemorate it? It points backwards to Jesus. But we continue with the meal. And so the meal continues in verse 19, and it says, And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given to you. Well, remember what I said earlier, everything in the Old Testament points towards Jesus. And remember, he had to give a whole multitude in John chapter 6 this lesson, right? You know, because the multitudes, you know, they thought that God fed them. Remember, they were in the wilderness, okay, and they complained about not having food. And what does the Father feed them with? Manna from heaven, right? Manna from heaven. And so Jesus makes a point that they were fed with this manna from heaven, which sustained their earthly lives, right? But what does Jesus come to do, right? He has come for our eternal preservation, right? So it says in John chapter 6, 
verses 57 through 58, as Jesus responds to them, he says, as the living Father has sent me, and I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. And this is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread that the fathers ate and died. But whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Why? Because he is the manna given to us from heaven that you and I will live. It's one of those things he says that I am the what? Bread of life. The bread of life. Now, through his sacrifice, okay, Pastor Norman talked about this earlier in the scripture reading, that Jesus will establish a new covenant with his people, right? A new covenant. And it's not like the one given by God through the laws of Moses, which, as I've told you before, was conditional and dependent on their obedience, right? You go read there, you know, and you go spend some time in Deuteronomy chapter 28, you'll get the picture, right? If they obey, they get what? Blessings. If they disobey, they get curses. I don't know if some of y'all read that chapter, but if you just do the proportion, the curses list is about twice as long as the blessings, right? About twice as long. But see, this new covenant, you know, the whole point of the law, as Paul talks about, is what? To identify sin. To identify sin because the law justifies who? No one. No one. No one can keep it. None of us can walk perfectly before God. And so as a plan before the foundations of the world, Jesus establishes this new covenant, right, in which he completed the requirements of the law and perfect obedience, but then he switched with us. But he bore the penalty of a lawbreaker, right? You know, if you, if you look at that scene that day when he's standing before Pontius Pilate and they call him to crucify him and they're willing to exchange Jesus for Barabbas, a murderer, right? A, rebell, a, rebell, a, a rebell, rebellious person, right? That's what he's doing. But when you look at that picture, you should see that what essentially is happening is Barabbas is you and I. That is a picture of Jesus exchanging himself. Even though he did nothing to deserve death, he exchanges himself and takes the place of sinners. He is our Passover lamb. And in order that the church should remember his sacrifice, his love for us, the importance that we reflect his sacrifice in our faith and live in this present life with hope, holding fast to his glorious promises he now institutes the second part of the supper. In verse 20, he says, And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in our blood. And this new covenant is significant change from the one handed down by Moses in the Old Testament and the one from the prophets. In what ways do you ask? I'm glad you asked that question. Let me share two things with you. One big change. Two big changes I want to highlight. Number one, uh, this new covenant is significant in this way, that God's word will no longer be written on tablets of stone. Right? Remember Moses, he goes up 40 days and 40 nights up Mount Sinai to get the word of God. And he was up there without food because he can be in the presence of God and be on a fast uh, like that. But he goes up there and he comes down with the tablets. Everybody's seen the Moses movies, right? They come down with the tablets, the word of God, right? But no more. Not because of Jesus, but see now, and even as spoken about the prophecy of the Old Testament, our hearts of stone will be transformed. Will be transformed and his word will be poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. Because God has promised to give us of his own nature for which is the only means we can have godly affections. It's the only way that it's possible that we can obey God and desire God. And glorify his name. And his blood, like the wine cup he divided amongst his disciples, ensures that not only that it speaks to that we're unified with Christ, but what else does it speak to? That we share in his holiness. We share in his holiness. And so God's word, number one, would no longer be written on tablets of stone. And God, number two, very important thing, that God's covenant is no longer exclusively between Israel and God. Right? The Gentiles, as you and I, are not included. 
But as a matter of fact, if you really study the Bible, you realize that was the plan before creation. Right? You can see that in the prophetic writings, how they speak to the fact that God would include the Gentiles in the redemptive creation. Right? Even look at the genealogies. Right? Look at the genealogies. You see God's plan working that way. Then if you look at the genealogies of Jesus, there are two people I want to know that were Gentiles. The first one, Rahab. Praise the Lord. The great, 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 I tell my kids, the great, 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 great grandmother of David and then of Jesus. Right? Remember Rahab? She let the spies come in before the people of God overthrew Jer- or Jericho. Remember her? She is in the lineage of Jesus. One more person. Ruth. Ruth. She was a Moabitess. She was a Moabitess that decided not to stay in her own hometown, but to come back with Naomi to her people. Right? And then you see a picture of her redemption by the husband that took her. Right? And so God had this plan before the beginning of the creation that the church that has come forth from the 12 disciples will be constituted of every nation, tribe, and tongue. That's why Paul wrote in Romans chapter 10, verse 12 through 13, he says, But there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing all all his riches on all who call on him. And here's a qualification to come into the kingdom. He says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Every nation, tribe, and tongue. And we need to hold fast to this, especially in our culture that's overtaken by politics and all these various things. Why? This is the reason why nationalism of any kind, of any race that's leading it, it is utterly incompatible with the gospel. There is no compatibility between the two. And any time the church tries to merge the two, what do we do? We corrupt the gospel. We corrupt the gospel. It doesn't matter which race is doing it. Every nation, tribe, and tongue, a reconstituted people of God. This is a lesson the 12 disciples had a problem with as well. Because remember, they didn't want a Jesus that was dying for Gentiles. Also, They wanted him to come to elevate Israel in the earth. But that's not what Jesus came to do. And so we have to remember that Jesus did not come to die for a country or a nation. He came to die for a people of every nation, tribe, and tongue to do what? To inhabit a new kingdom. Right? Right? But not just future, but present. We are to look like a new kingdom like a strange and peculiar people that will be together. That seems to be all. That's not cultural. But the more we exemplify what we are to be in heaven, here on earth, that's when Christ is glorified. That's when people see the true kingdom. And so the new covenant spotlights the fact that God's word will be written on our hearts and that his covenant is with all who believe in him. And so as we close here, the institution of the Lord's Supper is rich in divine truth and hope for all that place their faith in Jesus for salvation. That the wine represents the blood that Jesus shed on the cross for our atonement and was completely necessary if you and I are to be reconciled with God. Why? Because without it, it's impossible. Without it's impossible. This is why the Hebrew writers say, and Pastor Norman read this earlier in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, when it says that under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That Jesus is our Passover lamb, that he has come, and no longer do priests go before us anymore to continue to make sacrifices over and over again every year. No, he came once and for all. He is not returning to die for sins. He is not returning as a little baby in a manger and all this stuff. No, he is coming as king riding on the white horse in all his glory. And we will be with him. We will be with him. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And so, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And as a divine companion to the wine, for we cannot have one without the other, what, what is given? The bread. Right? The bread is given, which is representative of the life that we have been granted now in Jesus that will sustain us into eternal life. 
And so every month when you and I come together and we observe communion, the Lord's Supper, we are reminded how Jesus' body was crushed, right? How his blood was shed on the cross with him. And as we drink and eat of these elements, we're reminded we're not being unified with Jesus. If you're a Christian, you're already one with him. The supper reminds us of this truth, reminds us of this truth. And the truth in this sacrament, it nourishes us and it refreshes our soul to everlasting life. It is meant to help us in our faith every day, every day. You know, I have had saints that decided because they're just having a rough day that I, I can't eat from the Lord's table. That's a gross misinterpretation of what it means to come to the table in an ill way. No, if you need Jesus, you come to the table. You drink, you eat. That that strength in your faith reminds you that though we don't have great days, that God has not changed his mind about his people. Unchanged. You think of Peter, we're going to get into that a little bit later in the next couple of weeks. You know, next week we're going to get into them. You know, it seems like they had this wonderful meal and they back to prideful acts of speaking with one each other. But also later on we're going to get to Peter who uh, claimed that he was going to ride or die with Jesus until the end. Right? And he denies Jesus. Right? And I've told you before, we like to look at Judas, but one act is not greater than the other. Judas' betrayal of Jesus is on equal par with Peter's denial. But what is the difference? Peter belonged to Christ. And in the last chapters of John 8, Jesus, God, pursues him. Remember, Peter, he just goes back to his old ways. I'm going to go fishing. Right? Because he's just down. There's no way for him to return to him. Ain't you glad that God chases us? He comes and he restores Peter back to his position. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. My mind is unchanged about you. And that's what the communion should remind us of. Unchanged. Come to Jesus. Amen? Let us pray. Father, we thank you. that your goodness abounds to us as your children. We thank you, Father, that our salvation is not predicated on our goodness, for we have none. That our salvation is not predicated on our good works and our attempts to obey the law, because we can't do it in the way that you demand. For we know that your law requires perfection. And we don't have it, but you sent us the most precious thing in creation, your son Jesus, to be perfect, that we may receive the full benefits of your salvation, that we then can pursue rightful obedience to you out of love. And so, Lord, we just pray that you help us to remember when we take of the wine and the bread, all you have done for us. We pray that that remembrance would bring forth joy in our hearts. But not just joy for what you've done, but the other thing that you instituted that it's supposed to accomplish, but how it will be fulfilled in the new creation. But most importantly, how we will be there with you. And as we observe the new the communion, we remember these words when you said that you will come again to get us, that we may be where you are. And help us, Heavenly Father, that these things will fill us in thanksgiving in all seasons and times of life. And we thank you, Father. We pray this prayer, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.